It's going to be a little bit hard to follow that one, so uh, so apologies. <laughs> Um, so uh, next we're going to uh, move on to a showcase for RDCA DAP. So looking at uh, data empowering research and machine learning. So would like to welcome up Kara and Laura from Iridia, which is the uh, platform that we utilize for RDCA DAP and Ian Braun with CPATH. All right, we might need to do a little rejigging here, so give us a second, because we have some exciting stuff today. So we have a laptop. All right, uh, so hello everyone. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for the mic as well. Um, so we're gonna be talking to you today about RDC ADAP, a platform you've probably heard mentioned at the conference so far. Maybe you've seen it, maybe you've used it, maybe you have no idea what it is. Just curious by show of hands if anyone has actually seen the platform or is a user, has logged in before, that kind of thing. So it's not many <laughs> if you look around the room. So this is, this is quite cool for us because Laura and I, uh, we'll talk about this in a moment, kind of what we do and where we're from, uh, but we're going to be talking about the platform and we also have Ian here from CPATH um, and he has first-hand experience as well, especially from the data side. Uh, we're going to be talking about fair data, why that's really powerful, uh, and machine learning is here. It's a buzzword these days, uh, but we're gonna talk about how this data is not just sitting by itself on a platform, but by combining data and people and tools, it can become a lot more powerful together. Um, and that's really the whole, the whole purpose of this platform. So um, it's also a platform that's not just limited to researchers and data scientists and pharma and biotech. This is something that is also for the community itself. Uh, it's meant to have patient input, it's meant to have interaction with the wider rare disease community. So we also want to encourage everyone to just, you know, feel free to take a look at the platform because it's open uh, for a reason and it's FDA funded and it's shared and it's advocated here by CPATH for a reason. We want to have this dialogue. So without further ado on the intro here, let's see if it's playing ball for us. There we go. Uh, so what we're going to be talking about today, um, I think we might need to make sure we're sharing things properly. There we go. All right, cool. Um, so we'll, uh, <laughs> we'll let that get sorted there, but um, what we're gonna be talking about today uh, for RDC ADAP is, is built on a platform by Iridia. Um, so Iridia develops platforms for uh, digital research um, in a cloud environment. So it's something that globally people can connect with. Um, they can collaborate and do work safely and securely uh, and most importantly, they can use that to drive better patient outcomes. Um, so for myself, um, I'm at Iridia, I'm Carol Lassiter, I'm the head of customer success. Um, and for RDC ADAP, I'm kind of the technical lead um, of all things platform and technical side, but also trying to help align things with that wider rare disease community. So very plugged into that. Laura? Hi, um, my name is Laura Shishodia. Um, at Iridia, my job title is product manager. I know in pharmaceutical, in medical sphere, that can mean many different things. Um, at Iridia, it means my job is to gather feedback from all of our users across both the RDC ADAP and our other installations of the DRE, and make sure the feedback from the end users, from the stakeholders, is being fed back into the product and that it's being released into the world for use, so that our product is doing what our users need when they need to do it. I'm Ian Braun, so I'm a data scientist working at CPATH, um, and I work on the um, curation workflows um, associated with um, getting data from contributors, curating it, um, applying automated workflows where necessary, and getting it onto the platform. All right, and I'll turn it over to Laura to talk a little bit more about what the platform really is. So another show of hands. Um, who before this conference had not heard of the term FAIR in the context of data sharing? A few. Oh, more than a few, okay. So FAIR data sharing is, uh, it's, it's not just an Iridia or a CPATH thing, it's, um, it's 
much wider than that. And it describes a means of gathering and sharing your data um, that makes your data both findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. When we talk about findable, we mean that other users could maybe come and they could find and search for your data. Accessibility in the context of data means that you can request that data if you want to use it, and um, that you can then have access to that data to use it as you need it. The meaning of interoperable um, essentially comes down to your data being well described. Could a fellow researcher come along, see your data, and understand what it's for and how they could use it? We've heard a lot of instances over the past few days of um, the wrong data being available and you not having access to quite the right data. Maybe if the data was well described, you know exactly what you're looking for. The reusability kind of speaks for itself. Um, in our context, it means that when you're using the data in a project sense, when that data is maybe returned to the pool and maybe used in a, in a further context down the road, that someone else could come along, they could see the results of your analysis, they could maybe rerun it, that kind of thing. So that makes up one side of the DRE, and it's having that data in a, in a safe, stored manner. Um, and the other part of the DRE, so the other part of the RDCA DAP platform, is what we call the workspaces. Workspaces are essentially a virtual laboratory for your team or your project to work in. They are secure, so the data is served into this virtual um, environment, and only your trusted colleagues are allowed access to that data. It comes with analytical tools, which we will show you shortly. Oh, we didn't mention we're going to attempt a live demo today, which is keeping us all on our toes. Um, so we're, we'll show you some of those live analytics. And what we won't quite show you today are, is the scalability as well. So you don't have to invest as a project in lots of long-term hardware, maybe kind of high-level compute. We can provide that on a kind of um, rental basis. And the last thing that our workspaces allow is accessibility from across the globe. So you can collaborate with colleagues, with um, maybe with um, people who are reviewing your science, for example, in any country. And this also means and supports data sovereignty. So you, can, you as a researcher can access data that you maybe wouldn't be allowed to um, because of where you physically are. So both of these parts um, of the RDC ADAPT platform we will show you later today. All right, um, and then I think you've all seen this before, but it's, it's kind of worth putting this in the context of what the platform is and what it does. Um, so we kind of envision RDC ADAP as having this kind of flow of data, um, especially like Ian was mentioning on the curation side, there's a lot of work that's done to curate data to make sure it's kind of standardized, it's something that is also enriched over time. Uh, there'll actually be a, a presentation, I think, right after this, so a little plug for that on um, another way that you can enrich data with ontologies. Um, and it makes it possible to try to connect data in different ways, novel ways that haven't been attempted or, or been possible to do before. Um, and that's only possible if you have this kind of robust framework for being able to work on the data and share it and be able to publish the iterations over time. Um, so the platform facilitates that kind of framework for being able to publish that and share that and also be able to control the access, which is quite important. Um, because the data is, is something that is important to share and to remove some of those silos and barriers to access. But equally, it's important to make sure it's secure and it's audited and all of that's accounted for and the provenance is tracked throughout the whole way. Um, and one of the other ways that this is uh, kind of an important part of the platform, like I said, from that, that patient and patient advocacy side as well, is greater levels of transparency into what data is out there, uh, what's being shared, what the impact is of that data, how it's being used. Um, so there's a lot of tools built into the platform, especially on that FAIR data side, um, that tries to track and capture that so there's a better, better level of understanding and clarity there. Um, and it also helps you visualize and kind of get a sense of the, the stats and data sets that are available uh, without needing to have access to the field level data itself. Um, so it, it just brings a lot more transparency to that process across the board. Um, and then of course the outcome of all of this um, is trying to find, you know, um, advanced models for drug development, uh, disease progression, better understanding of that that can also lead to new solutions, new therapies, new drugs, um, and actionable, you know, insights that actually feed back into the community. So that's kind of underpinning the whole idea. Um, but as we've, as we've said, uh, this, all, this all exists. Uh, so it's really cool to see it, um, and that's one of the reasons we want to 
I want to dive into that a little bit more today. Um, and before we go into that bit, um, it's worth kind of stepping back and just thinking about what's the, what's the purpose of this. Um, and there's a couple of central goals here. So I think I'll ask, um, especially for that data perspective, for Ian to, to kind of describe why this is um, a crucial gap to fill. Sure, yeah. So um, one of the central goals of the initiative is to create this um, platform for rare disease data sets um, that can sort of act as a, a storefront for publishing and managing um, this data on a global scale. Um, and then also, um, critically, the platform is also designed in a way that the data and the metadata that describes it um, can adhere to these um, four fair principles, um, findability, accessibility, interoperability, and reusability that we were mentioning earlier. Um, so the FAIR platform itself is um, critical to making data findable and accessible by providing sort of a central um, location where users or researchers can come and um, search for data, um, go through the metadata that describes the data, and use some of the tools that we're going to talk about in a bit to figure out if that data um, indeed fits their need or their use case. Um, and also manages accessibility by providing um, these workflows for requesting um, access and having the data delivered to a secure workspace. Um, um, the curation that goes into um, adding data to the platform from the CPATH side once it's contributed to CPATH um, contributes to the interoperability because we go through a curation process of making sure that the um, tables and columns and field level values of the data set are described in a way that makes it easy to um, apply whatever techniques or analyses um, you need to, to bring to the data set for your particular use case. Um, and as I mentioned before, one of the, the key aspects of that is that kind of that audit trail and the security along the whole, the whole route of that. Um, so one of the other goals of the platform is to try to make that as easy as possible, especially for data owners and data stewards to be able to manage who's accessing the data and what's being done with it. Um, and by trying to alleviate some of that burden, because it can be quite a high administrative burden to managing a lot of data, um, so trying to automate some of that and try to make data access um, something that's built into the platform for um, identity and information about projects and usage for that data and making it easier to, to manage that kind of record of what data sets have been accessed for what projects over time um, and be able to say that all of that's been governed by those rules of, of terms of use and access conditions and all that can be attributed back to the data that was used for whatever models or results were generated. And if we look at the fourth point here, one of the things that we've heard time and time again over the last day and a half or so is that it really does take a collaborative effort to make strides in any research area. What we hope to provide as a central goal in the platform is that area where you can really collaborate um, with your colleagues and uh, with your other researchers. The platform allows the data to be stored in one central place and it allows you to control access to that data um, to the right people. But it means those people don't have to be sitting next to you. They don't have to um, be in, even in the same room as you or the same continent. They can access your data, um, the data that they have access to, um, from what, when, wherever they are, whenever they need. It also allows you to bring experts into your project at the right time. So, for example, if you've got initial access to the data but data science isn't your specialist, you can bring your data science colleague in to give you a hand there. Maybe further down the line, um, you're wanting to take your results to the FDA, you can actually bring them in as well. And they can see that data um, in its space, run the same analysis and show it live um, to the people who need to approve that drug or that um, research at the end of its life. And finally, the pro the, um, supporting the key goal of any project, which is publication um, and sharing your findings and your results, whether they be good or they be bad. The state of your workspace and the state of the DRE is maintained um, after your project. So should you need to come back to that in three, four or five years time when you've got your next iteration of that drug development, you've got the next iteration of your project, you can come back and find everything exactly as you left it. As Cara mentioned, um, the access to the data is audited and so you as a data owner know who's got access to your data and where it's been used. But the actions that you do on your data are also audited and they're also controlled. And this means, again, you can look back at what you've done and you can, uh, you can kind of refresh your memory and you can build on those results um, and keep, 
keep making new strides. All right, um, and I'll just briefly mention this because I think we've heard uh, a couple of timelines and a couple of kind of history lessons today on, on various initiatives for rare diseases. Um, but it's worth kind of pointing out that um, the, the kind of journey for RDC ADAP started years ago uh, in 2019. Um, and it's been a, a collaborative effort between CPATH and FDA, um, as well as between especially um, the groups that have, have worked with um, NORD and CPATH um, and have contributed data and have kind of fed into this, this initialization of the, of the platform. Um, and in terms of the data itself, um, I think Ian was mentioning, you know, there's a lot that goes into the curation side. Um, so I'll, uh, I'll kind of put a bookmark on that because um, I want to make sure we have some time here for, for demonstrations. Um, but one of the things that also, that also came up is in 2021, um, that's when the platform was first launched. Um, so we've been getting feedback from 2021 with kind of early beta testers. Um, and then later that year, it was publicly launched. Um, so it's been available since then. Um, and there's been a lot of engagement from um, researchers and industry members uh, and academia um, getting involved and, and getting involved with the data and, and research initiatives on the platform itself. Um, but I also want to, to kind of call out here for Ian, um, if he wants to mention a little bit about CPONT uh, that's mentioned here. Sure, and we'll hear more about um, CPONT in the next talk, but basically this is uh, an ontology that we're, we built from existing um, vocabularies to help standardize um, our data sets internally and increase their interoperability. And um, sort of importantly, this is also um, what's the basis of our current efforts to expand on how researchers and users will be able to um, explore the data on the platform or query mm -hmm. um, about um, what sort of information is contained within the, the data sets on the platform. So for example, something like coming to the platform and being able to find all the different data sets that contain a patient with a particular phenotype or a particular phenotype um, that has a, is caused by a particular gene, et cetera. Um, and one of the things, too, that, that's been really good to see um, as the platform has been, has been launched and there's been more engagement with the community here, um, there have been more and more data sets that have been um, added to this, this data catalog um, in 2022, 64 data sets uh, and over 24 diseases. Um, and that kind of brings us to today, where we still have more data, more diseases being added, and we also have um, research projects with their own dedicated spaces, and their own, they're kind of like, you know, your own lab environment, where you've got your tools and your data and your team in it. So there's a lot of um, kind of changes over time, where research projects are spun up and spun down, um, but one of the important things here is that this is, this is providing that framework for all of that to kind of come and play under the same environment here. Um, and what happens next, um, that really depends a lot on the engagement that, you know, we keep getting from the community because the platform is ever changing, it's ever developing and improving. Um, we get a lot of feedback, especially from the CPATH team about data curation and how to make data more available. But we also get a lot of feedback from the users, uh, the researchers and the patient advocacy side about how this platform can be more useful to them. Um, and so those kind of things are, are constantly featured here. Um, and we'll actually end today just showing a snippet of some of the things to come. But uh, the most important thing here uh, is live demo. <laughs> so we've got things pulled up. Uh, and what we're going to show you today um, is kind of two different perspectives here at play. One of them is the, the patient side, um, where you're looking at, um, like I was mentioning earlier, what's on the platform, what data is here. Maybe you're interested in contributing or getting involved somehow. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about that and show you what that kind of perspective looks like. Um, and then Laura is also going to talk about the research side um, and what it looks like if you're not only using data on the platform, but diving into some of those analytical tools. Um, there's a lot built in, but it's also a very kind of extensible platform. So there's a lot, lot involved if you want to get more advanced. Um, so that's where the machine learning comes in. And I'll show you a little bit today about how machine learning on the platform, uh, you know, can be done and it's, it's you know, I say simple, and that's, that's not to trivialize it, uh, but it's something that's it's quite cool to see because it does kind of show the, the power of this platform, especially if you, uh, you know, if you bring all those, the people and the data and the tools into the same environment and give them the freedom to be able to do what they do best. So I'm going to flip into a browser here, and let's see if we can get things pulled up. All right. Um, so, like I said, we'll talk about patient side first. Um, so, what I'm showing right now is the RDC ADAP portal. Um, so, this is uh, both kind of an information 
portal. It's got um, lots of lots of good info here about the kind of the whole purpose of the initiative. Um, we're all, I think, familiar with that here today. Uh, but one of the things that's also uh, useful here is it gives you some guidance about what the platform is, how to use it, what your kind of first steps are um, if you're interested in getting involved. If you're looking at this as well, particularly from kind of the patient side, um, like, I, like I mentioned a moment ago, you might be particularly interested with how you can contribute data. Um, if you're someone who has, um, you know, or an organization that has research data sets, studies, clinical trials, and so forth, um, you can reach out to CPATH and you can connect with them and let them know what you have and, and that you'd like to, to be involved. Um, one of the other things here too is just some guidance that if you're a single patient or a patient advocacy, um, you know, kind of persona here, um, there's other resources you can get involved with registries like Nord um, and you can help, you know, contribute and feed this, this growing body of knowledge. So if I was interested in that, um, there's, you know, kind of a simple form here and you can just, you know, get in touch really instantly uh, with CPATH and you can provide some info um, so they can better understand what kind of, what kind of data that you have uh, and how you want to, to contribute that. Um, and then if you're interested in what data already exists, we can take a look at Fair Data Services here. So this is, as Ian mentioned, this is kind of like the shop front. We've got all the data sets, all the metadata. Um, it's all here to be browsable, searchable, and findable for you. Um, so this is kind of the front landing page that you'll see here on FAIR. Um, it very helpfully as well talks about the FAIR principles. So if you'd like to do some evening reading, you have all about that there. Um, and then if you're interested in the data sets that are at play, uh, you can browse all the metadata of these data sets and learn a little bit more about what's here. So we've got names and description. Um, I can also filter this if I wanted to look for some of the most recent data. Um, I can edit that, and I can also set it so I'm looking at data that's made available on the platform for people to view. Um, so if I see a data set here, um, so this is Mimic. Uh, this is, I think, a pretty well-known EHR data set. Um, so what you'll see kind of right off the bat for any of these data sets is just some descriptive information about what's there. Um, you know, descriptions, authorship, uh, publishing, information, um, you know, things about the, the license, if this is something that is open access or if you need to request approval for it. Um, there's some good information there that just kind of describes what you're looking at for all these data sets. And then when it comes to the data itself on kind of a field level basis, you can see uh, what information is describing the actual fields here. Um, so there's usually multiple tables that make up um, a data set. And if you wanted to see what was inside those tables, you can start to, you know, kind of browse through that and you can see what these fields are. Um, and you can see what types they are um, and if they're potentially something um, that is requestable uh, or if this is something that you can preview and do some basic kind of stats and visuals on. Uh, you can also come back to um, searching for like really specific things. So. If I was to search for a data set rather than just kind of browse the whole catalog, um, there's a bunch of filtering kind of options here built in. So if I wanted to look for something specifically that was already set for our cohort builder visualizer, um, I can select that option. And I've got a couple keywords here about, you know, different things that have been tagged on data sets. Um, so I think I'll go through some demographics here and we'll show an example with cohort builder where you can start to visualize uh, some of that data. So we've got a synthetic clinical trial data set here um, about PKD. And similar, you know, thing, we've got a lot of information here. Um, I can go straight into the, the cohort builder. And like I mentioned, the cohort builder is something that is um, great for visualizing and getting a preview of data. Um, I can also build in really specific filters and create cohorts of data and subcohorts, or I can just see what kind of data is at play. Um, so if I wanted to see what kind of a breakdown was of, you know, sex for this particular data set, um, it starts showing me visuals right off the bat. And I've not had to, you know, access the raw data in order to understand what's, what's present here for this data set. So I have a cohort that I've already saved to help save on some time. Um, and for this cohort, um, I've already got it kind of broken out for um, kind of a female subset here. Um, and if I wanted to go to kind of a breakdown of what the, what the spread was uh, for this particular clinical trial, 
Um, I can look at some of the demographics and the breakdown here. Um, let's look at race and let's look at age. So this is kind of the, you know, the real-time breakdown of this data. Um, and I can also customize some of these cohorts. So if I wanted to create a second cohort here uh, with um, kind of a male selection on that. Um, so now I can see, you know, just at a glance there pretty quickly, um, I can see what that, what that kind of demographic spread looks like for this data set. And I can maybe even see that there's underrepresented populations here, um, or if the spread it looks to be really good. Um, and I can save that and I can share that with, um, you know, friends, colleagues, family <laughs> that joined me on the platform here. So I'm gonna send this to Laura um, and I'll let her view uh, that cohort. So that's how that can be kind of used, especially like we're mentioning from that patient perspective of interacting with this and interacting in that dialogue with CPATH. Um, but what happens if you're a researcher? I'm gonna turn it over to Laura to show a little bit more on the analytics side. Thanks, Cara. So like Cara said, we're now moving from the persona of the patient to the persona of the researcher. So this is someone who is coming along, maybe they've had a colleague um, flag up some data to them and they want they, they've asked me to look into more information um, about this data. So again, I'm landing on the same page. Um, this is a, a portal which is for all users. It's not, it's not tailored to a particular um, persona. Uh, so it's, it's giving me the services I need as well. As a researcher, I know the first thing I need to do is create that workspace that I can bring my data into. This can be easily done using this link right here. It is a very quick, so that's seven question form, which um, once you've filled out and you have submitted, that will actually get sent directly to the CPATH team. They can then get back in touch with you if they've got further questions and they want to discuss um, your project a bit further, but otherwise they will provision you with a workspace um, very quickly. Usually I think it's two to three days, if I'm correct, around that. So you can access this data relatively quick, quickly if you need it. So assuming that that's happened for the purposes of today, um, I now think that I want to go and find that data that's been flagged to me so that I can, um, I, can, I can see those cohorts and I can actually move that data into my research workspace to get a, a finer view of it. So I'm gonna jump into FAIR again. And I don't know if you can see, but in my browser here at the top, um, I'm working now in this orange uh, space. And um, it just means that that's actually slightly segregated from the one Cara was looking at, just so that you know it is slightly different. We're not looking at exactly the same thing here. So I know um, that my colleague Cara has sent me um, this data set. Um, so I should actually be able to see it if I look in my cohorts. When I think it was that top one, wasn't it? Or was this, oh, there we go. So again, I can go in here um, and I can see exactly what she sent me. So that's really cool. Um, and it's a nice way of collaborating, like Cara said, before you have real access to the data. So I can see that, that view. Um, I can actually kind of um, build on this as well and I can, I can get maybe a different view that I need to. But in this case, I'm gonna to jump to my searches. So again, Cara could have uh, shared her search with me um, to send me the exact data set that, that she wants to collaborate on. Again, I'm jumping into the same thing. And as Cara showed earlier, um, there's like a lot of good information here that is um, available to educate me about what is in this data set. So knowing that I want access to it, what I need to now do is make a request. This is done very easily, again, using a form which is within the platform. I'm not gonna go through this um, step by step because it's a slightly longer form than the last time and it's not particularly interesting to show you. Um, but again, it's just asking for information about your study, about yourself, about your credentials, um, just so that we know, or the data owner knows, that the data that they're sharing with you is going to the right people. Um, we have a four safes model. And one of those safes is that we have trusted people who are accessing our data. So we just need to check that the people accessing the data can be trusted. Um, once you've popped your information in here, because it's things like your contact details, again, if um, the data owner or the uh, CPATH curators need to get in touch with you, they can do that. Once I've submitted this form, um, there's a background process which goes on where the owner of the data or the assigned um, person at CPATH will then actually give you access to that data on a per data set basis. So I might actually go in and request two or three different data sets, but if that owner doesn't want to share that data with me, they don't have to. So as 
a, maybe a trial participant, um, as a patient who's been part of a previous study, you know that your data isn't just going to anyone, it's only going to people who those, um, your trial, the people who run the trial uh, really trust uh, with that data. So, having accessed the data, and again, let's assume for the purposes of today that I have been granted access, I can see a list of all the requests for data that I've made. And the one that we're looking at is this top one, which we've prepared. Um, so this is, what I'm doing here is I'm now ready to transfer that data into one uh, workspace that I requested earlier. So if I start that now, and the data gods are kind, we should be able to see the data being delivered into my workspace. So we've now gone um, from fair services, um, if you remember I talked about earlier, into the workspace sphere of the DRE. Each workspace is kind of like a project in itself. So this is your project area. You can see in this example, I'm maybe a member of three different projects. Um, but for today, we're going to look at my research demo project. Oh, did I click on it? I did not click. There we go. So when I land in here, my project um, has been set up so that it's got some information, it's got some useful links here. Um, I can see a list of my collaborators, so I know that I'm collaborating with the right people. If I have the right credentials um, and the right uh, level of authority, I can also invite other people into my project as well. My data, which is delivered, is going to end up in my inbox, unsurprisingly. So I can click in here, and I can actually see the requests that have been sent. So if I go into my fair for the demo, that is actually the data which we've just uh, requested today. So I want to take all that data and I want to prove it for use in my workspace. So I'm going to do that and I'm going to pop it into my data folder. And we're going to confirm. And in the background, that data is actually being moved from a kind of uh, middle storage space into my workspace. So that data now belongs in my project and I can use it um, for my own analysis. So if I jump into my files and my data folder, I can actually see the right folder, wait, right file, sorry. And this here is a receipt. And that receipt has come with the data. Um, it, there's a copy of it as well, stored in FAIR. So again, the owner of that data has a list of all the receipts of where all their data has gone, so they know exactly where it is. Um, and as the data receiver, I have a receipt which again includes all that metadata, that really useful metadata that we talked about earlier. So I've got instructions about how I can use the data. I've got descriptions of what's really in the data as well. So to get into it, um, like you saw, there was um, a list of all the different data sets, um, and we can easily transform them into database tables. So each workspace, each project has its own allocation of database space that comes free of charge as part of the, um, part of the project. And if I click into the demographics, so this is the same data set we were looking at at FAIR, but we now have access to the line level data. For the purposes of today, we're using a synthesized data set. Um, we also uh, support pseudonymized data sets. Again, if you're um, different levels of access depending on the type of study. So I can see here a lot more detail about each line of my data set. And if I go into analyze data on the right here, I can now see the line level data ignore that bit because we were doing a practice earlier. There we go. So I can now see the line level data. And maybe I want to get into more depth of information than I could see in that cohort builder that we saw earlier. If I was a braver woman, I would try and show you the same box and whisker chart, but I'm not. So <laughs> for today, so maybe I want, I, well, I want a different analysis. So I'm going to look at the age distribution of this study. And I can do that by selecting age and selecting my frequency bar chart, mostly because I'm not a data scientist and I understand frequency bar charts. So I go in here, it takes a little while to generate, and you can see there's an interesting distribution of the age in my study. And I can also change this. I can, for example, fill that by the sex of the participants in my study. And if I just do a quick rerun, you can see that that will then adapt and change. These are all built using R which is the data scientist language of choice. Um, the code that is used is then available to you to take on and develop further. This is a very, very basic analysis. 
Um, but if you wanted to take that and you wanted to run with it and use that, um, you can do by copying this and then using it further in the platform. The platform itself supports R very natively, um, but it also supports other programming languages such as SQL. So again, one that we've prepared earlier, um, if you were preferred SQL to R, um, many people do, um, you could use the platform to write this. We've preloaded it, but you could be writing this and you could again do much more in-depth um, analysis of that data set. This is where you can then get, again, you're, you're filtering down this large set of data that you have if you press the button properly. I'm using Kara's laptop, that's going to be my excuse. The second line is the hyperlink. The what one? The second line of text, yeah, if you select it, and then you do the run selected. It's the second line of, yeah. Was it not? Oh. Product feedback. Thank you. <laughs> there we go. So again, here you've seen, you've got an interesting demographic, you want to dive further into it. Other tools that are included in here are, for example, um, a load of applications, so things like Jupyter Notebooks, um, RStudio for the data scientists among you are included as standard, um, we can provision virtual machines if you want to use GPU in your data, and you can also build your own applications. These give a really nice visual way for your users to get into the data. I'm going to hand back to Gareth because I realize I've talked too much, um, who is going to take you back to the end of the workflow. Yeah, no problem. Um, I think actually before I'll switch, I'll just do a little plug here for <laughs> the interactivity of the workspace. Uh, with something as simple as an R Shiny app, which is kind of like a you know mini mini application that's kind of uh, been prepared maybe to to show some interactivity inside a data set um, or be able to show um, you know specific results. Um, this links in live with the data inside the workspace. If you update that data, it's going to pull that updated in d updated data in, and it's going to let you interact with it in real time. Uh, so a little plug for that. Um, but yeah, let's let's talk a little bit on the machine learning side. Um, so. I'm inside a workspace right now that um, you, you might see, maybe it's small. Um, I am in a new hat today. Uh, this is the advanced machine learning researcher. So let's assume that's what I am, uh, even though I'm not. Um, and we'll talk about this from the perspective of advanced analytics. Um, so within the workspace, uh, like Laura showed, there's a lot of tools built in, um, but it's also, it's intentionally designed so you can bring tools or bring advanced skills into the workspace so I've been collaborating with one of my colleagues who is a very talented data scientist, um, and she's helped to bring in um, an open source uh, Jupyter Notebook and adapt it for the workspace to pull in data um, about trying to detect um, and trying to predict what type of brain tumors are at play. So uh, we've been shared with a Jupyter Notebook here. Uh, so this is it in the, in the raw. Um, I've also got some data inside this workspace that is um, uh, some imaging data itself, uh, so I can view, let's see, some of the, the apps here inside the workspace. We have an app that's been deployed that is an image viewer app, so I can look at medical images inside the workspace here. Um, let's take a look at just one or two of these. Uh, so we've got some, some scans here that have been loaded in, um, and this is also something that can be um, annotated, um, and I can make measurements inside the workspace. Um, so if I, especially if I was collaborating with colleagues, this is something that I can save and just share and kind of work with them in real time. Um, but the most interesting part about this, because that's more related to just looking at the images, the most interesting part about working with imaging data is trying to programmatically analyze large batches of data. Um, so if I was to look at this from the perspective of um, a data scientist who is trying to create some sort of predictive model here, um, I've already got some, some information loaded up here. I've got that Jupyter Notebook um, that is focused on machine learning. Um, so um, I won't, won't go through the, the nitty gritty on the machine learning model here, um, but I will go through a couple of, couple of examples. Um, so this is a um, kind of a beefed up virtual machine inside the workspace. So it's kitted out for machine learning. Um, machine learning can be a bit expensive at times. Uh, so if that's kind of one of the projects that's being run, uh, it kind of needs the right hardware for the job. Um, so show you a quick example. Um, this is pulling in that same kind of imaging data. Um, and I can also see 
Uh, let's look at a distribution of the different types of tumors that are inside the data, both from the perspective of a, a, data, um, a data set that is for training um, my machine learning model, um, and then a, a data set that is for testing it and seeing how it performed. So I will skip down through a little bit of this to make sure we have some time here. Um, and we'll look at the end here where we've run through, um, we've created a neural network that has three layers to it. So that's kind of like three iterations of a model. Um, and what it's done is it's tried to predict the type of tumors um, that are inside these uh, imaging data sets. So a bunch of numbers here, unless you're really good at looking at numbers as a human Excel document, um, it's probably better to visualize this. So if we look at what this, what this looks like, um, we can see a couple of data points showing up for the first layer, the second layer, and the third layer. And we can also see um, the training data set, it got progressively better. Um, and the validation data set, the one that I'm testing it on, it kind of did okay. Um, this is one of those cases where you wouldn't want just three layers, you'd want 50 or 60 or 100 or way more to get really good at predicting um, and giving you more true positives. So when I get to the kind of the end here, one of the other things that's kind of interesting to note um, is just kind of generally looking at how this, how this performs. Um, like I was saying, if, if you're looking at kind of the number of true positives versus false positives and so forth, um, it matters to be able to kind of compare that over that whole data set. And I would look at this clearly and see that there's a couple of these that are not lining up with the right tumor diagnosis uh, and the right prediction. So I'd want to iterate on this and build a lot more into it. So um, to kind of pause there for a moment, um, the last thing that I'll mention uh, is just that that kind of output of uh, results um, and being able to cite that back and, and attribute that to whatever data was involved. Um, inside the workspaces, you can create an airlock. Um, so that's something where you request to export your results and your findings. Um, and that's something that has to be approved by um, an administrator. So, um, if you wanted to export your, your model, export citations, um, then that's something that can be prepared, requested, and same thing on that kind of data, you know, gateway um, of access, that's something that can be approved and you can take that and you can publish that and you can share that with the, the wider community there. So, um, the last thing that we'll kind of go back to, let's go to the presentation bit, um, is just a little bit of a plug for what's to come. So I think we have a moment, yep. <laughs> a moment left. I'm going to be really brief on this. And instead of plugging what's going to come, I'm going to plug our workshop, which is in tomorrow morning. Um, we have a session where you can come. We can help you sign up. We can help you have an explore around. Um, and we can also show you um, any features that you would be particularly interested in. The platform itself, like I said, my job is to take feedback from users and to make sure that they, that makes it back into the platform. Um, we release every two weeks, so it's constantly being updated. In the next few months, you'll see, I don't know, some of you might have noticed um, when Cara was using it at the end there, it looked slightly different the interface. Um, so that's going to be rolled out a bit more widely. Um, we are currently working on that, those um, expanded support for the imaging and the genomics and the other non-linear data types. Looking a bit further into the future, into next year, we will be adding things like advanced version control, um, as well as the updated data metrics and a dashboard which allows the administrators of the platform table to um, get a bit better view of what exactly is going on. Anyway, like I said, um, tomorrow morning we do have a workshop, so if there are any questions, um, I'm happy to take them now, although we have about a minute left. Um, we're happy to take them now, or we are happy to field them tomorrow morning as well. There is links to the platform. They were in um, the presentation this morning, um, or just come and grab any of us, and we're happy to show you around. Thank you very much. Congratulations. I saw this uh, a year, 18 months ago, and you've come a long way. It's great. Well done. Um, it, the examples that you gave are, are research-oriented, which is, um, you know, the explicit stated purpose, which is great. My question is, uh, to what extent could or are you set up to um, use data that may then be used for regulatory purposes? That's a good question. 
Um, I think actually that's one of the one of the ideas of the platform is that there's not just you know the the kind of the use on the analytics side, but there's also use of that collaboration aspect where you can invite people in. So the it certainly translates. I think it's kind of a, a team sport for that. <laughs> there has to be a little bit of you know kind of give and take on both sides of willingness to try and willingness to experiment with that, because uh, that's not been the status quo, obviously. Um, but that is one of the things that the platform could lend itself to, because you've got the data and the analysis in the same environment. You don't have to recreate that. You could invite someone in to rerun it and validate that the data, the data is what it, what it says it is and that it's not been modified um, and that those models can be run on it. So um, I think that's a very potential direction that this goes. Um, but as I said, I think it is a team sport. So. This is really fascinating. Um, thank you. So my question is, what are your plans to expand this database to include other diseases? I know you went into a lot of detail, so I'm sort of asking the 30,000 foot question. I specifically am asking because ALS is kind of the new kid in the ALS in the CPATH family and wondering sort of where we go from there. Yeah, um, I think one of the, the plans long term for that, you'll probably hear some other, some other folks today talk about it a bit, but um, plans long term is to, to bring more kind of consortia onto the platform, have more data that's available and shared, um, and to not just limit this to, you know, the, some of the data sets that you saw there, um, but also talking about some of the other, some other C CPATH initiatives um, and especially data collaborations that have gone on and try to make something, you know, a little bit more um, kind of expandable and extensible for the communities at play. So um, I'm, I'm not the, you know, kind of the CPATH person that gets to coordinate some of that, but I would highly recommend asking them because we've got some people here for that. So thank you very much. Jeff. I mean, we, we are absolutely expanding the platform to include other data. We're actually, it's actually, uh, it's going to become, a, a version of this platform is going to become the core data platform for all of CPATH data. Some of the older data sets may remain on Coder, but we're transitioning all data over to there. And it's currently, we're starting to load CPR and data, data on there, which Colin's probably gonna talk about and, more. And just to add to your comment with the LS, you know, we're working with trying to, the, the AMP architecture group, we're trying to figure out who's gonna do what. Um, <laughs> I will say my biased opinion is, you know, they would do omics and we would do where our strengths are in clinical data and link them together in a functional way. That would be most rapid to starting us up. So that's why, that's our hope. And I think the short data just to kind of, or the short answer just to piggyback on both of those is that this is not only for specific data. This is for all data. That is the goal. As, me, as many disease states as we can get in here, long term is what's going to help us really to be able to aggregate that data and use it in the way that we want. So this is by no means at all limited to what's in there now, targets. I mean, really, the, the long term plan is exactly that. And, and just to add to that, I think, you know, one of the things that's beautiful about RDC ADAP is because there's a lot of learnings and looking at rare disease, you know, data from lots of different domains. And the next session, we'll talk a little bit about that what, from a, a strengths perspective with two disease states that we're looking at. But I mean, there's a lot of capacity, a lot of learnings, you know, there's a lot of um, applicability to regulatory science that's that's housed within this data set. So, you know, our hope is to, to continue to expand it into the ALS community. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you.